Jesus was the right six excuses to stop our foes for all the action we may make. Clinical, Clinical help, help won't confirm, confirm how its, its system containing the personal details, details of up to 450,000 patients was, was hacked, or, or if there was, was any warning. The Education Ministry has ordered the closure, closure of an early, early childhood, childhood centre, centre, attended by a boy who was subsequently murdered. And the Health Minister says he expects medical staff at Palmerston North Hospital to cooperate fully with an independent investigation into the death of a woman and her unborn baby at the hospital earlier this year. Those are the headlines. Our next news and weather is at seven. Pacific Waves, delving deeper into the major Pacific stories of the week in Aotearoa, New Zealand, the region and the world, I bring you interviews with Pacific newsmakers, experts and commentators in their fields, as well as up-to-date coverage from our talented team here at RNZ Pacific and our correspondents on the ground in the region. Pacific Waves, 8.15 weeknights on RNZ National. Welcome to Party People, uh, brought to you by the Public Interest Journalism Fund. Tonight, in the interest of enhancing trust and curbing misinformation, we've merged two powerful public entities, and they are, of course, Shane Tepo and Shane Jones, or as we like to call them, the Television Tanifa. <laughs> Just out of interest, mm. are you two in favour of the public, uh, the new public media entity? Yeah, I am. I'm, I'm in favour for two reasons. One, I think it will mean appalling of resources rather than uh, diversions of resources. And also I think that uh, media has changed and that uh, you've got radio on one hand, you've got television on the other, and then you've got an online presence and we need to bring the three together. And the other thing is I think it's about sharing resources. One thing that does concern me is the limited pool of Māori journalists in both TVNZ and RNZ, and I think uh, we'll bring we'll bring um, that uh, talent together, and Māori will benefit as a result of that. Tu whiranga kuaha. Mm. What about you, Shane? I'm a doubting Thomas. <laughs> I, I I'm, a, I'm a believer in um, public radio, and um, TV or whatever its replacement is having a role in maintaining democracy and civility and information in our society. But the three things that bother me, number one, the level of control or, or, or lack of independence on the board. That's the first thing. So they need to iron that out. Secondly, I'm not convinced, based on the television culture, that the new putia will actually go to where it's needed, which is at the front line, mm -hmm. and the entrepreneurs and the innovators who are actually exploring new media, medium as to how we get news out. And thirdly, I think it's time for us to um, call Māori TV out. Mm. I'm not happy that Māori TV floats around like a cultural equivalent of Pluto, uh, beyond any gravitational pull. At the end of the day, they are part of the public estate of, of media, um, obviously, I know lots of people on the board, and uh, Jamie Tuta, who um, I've got a high, reg a high regard for, and indeed mm. my own brother. But this is someone uh, who's looked at Māori TV for a long, long time, and I think that a, a genuine restructuring, Shane, would find a new role for Māori TV and a revamp role for the Māori radio stations. Yeah, no, and I, I think Shane's right. I think that is the unknown factor, the role that Māori television will will play. I can't put it as articulately as Shane just did, but the reality is I think it's a, it's a shadow of its former self. Mm. I, I was a supporter when we when Labour first set, set, set it up. I used to watch your show, for instance. I can't think the last time I watched Māori television. It just doesn't have that gravitational form as Shane has suggested. And uh, the other thing is is that um, iwi, station, uh, iwi stations play a very important part because in many of our rohe, it's the only new so local news source <laughs> that they have, but also fertile and important training ground for, for journalists and for techies and for others. Arguably, uh, Te Reo, Ngā Reo Irirangi is the most unique mm. news in Aotearoa. So you're calling them out and you want them to pull them in. What would it look like? Well, what I like about our Māori radio stations, in particular the ones on Taitokero, if there's manu kōrero, 
yep. or if there's uh, not just kapahaka, other initiatives that are turning on our young Māori learners, you can guarantee that Te Hiku Media will be there. And um, whether it's Rua Peka Peka, whether it's something at Ohaiwai or Hokianga, relatively obscure things, that should be mainstream um, material for Māori consumption. Uh, uh, with Māori TV, Māori radio, rather, there's the Whakaruruho. So, um, obviously, that's the abode, mm-hmm. the refuge. So, there'll be some legal complications how you do that. But at the end of the day, Māori TV is funded through the Minister of Māori Affairs and also partly through Māngai Pāho. They have all the levers and all the power. Follow the money and then you'll find who controls the honey. We'll have to uh, wait and see what happens with um, the new merger and, and how um, Whakata Māori and Ngā Reo Irirangi fit into the big picture. But um, I want to talk to you because, Shane, you're, you hail from the mighty Bay of Plenty and mm. Shane Jones, you're from the magnificent north. <laughs> yeah. And um, there's been a, a lot of kōrero on, on social media recently. What's happening with your roads? Yeah, look, there hasn't been the, in, the ongoing investment on on maintenance uh yeah when I was saw, last time you went back and oh no yeah i, I actually i i've traveled in the last few weeks both up north and 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 home and yeah you just notice it more and more particularly uh the 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 linkage roads rather than you know state highway highway 1 2 or 27 uh no it's it's got it's got critical and uh, i think we have to look at our not only our funding mechanism and, and how the, and how the money is spent, and uh, if we think it's a problem as an Aucklander or someone who lives in Whangini, Atara, Wellington or Christchurch, uh, it pales into insignificance compared to the folks that have to ride, ride, drive the roads of Waimana or Mangamuka. You can't even do that now. Yeah, yeah I think it's got to a critical stage. Yes, Shane, you're from... Well, we've got, to, we've got to bear in mind that these provincial areas mm. are great generators of our export Yes. Areas. Our export earnings are somewhere between 80 and 85 billion a year. Without them, the country goes broke. So I think too many politicians have pursued fanciful projects and have taken their eye off the maintenance ball. Unless we can continually maintain the resilience of our current infrastructure, our quality of life, uh, Mihi, is going to diminish. Well, so, well Sh- um, Simon Bridge is onto something. <laughs> with the Bridges well, campaign. Uh, it, uh, Simon um, and um, mm-hmm. Mr Joyce obviously were pushing the four-lane highway, and when you do drive from here down into Waikato, it's a pleasure to drive. Mm. But sadly, when you go to areas like Taitokiro and, and other regions, the potholes are worsening, the weather challenges are growing, electric cars don't pay towards the upkeep of the roads. Too much money has been spent on bike lanes and people who own bikes and ride around Auckland, they don't pay their way. What's the solution then? Because we talked about this earlier, you said and when it comes to electric cars. Well, uh, no, electric cars, as they grow, must be made to pay. I'm sure that will. NZTA mm. uh, is working on a strategy how um, you can attach a tax to the car. The notion that you can drive on an electric car while I and my diesel car have to pay and you drive for free... Uh, I'm not a great. I, I, I certainly don't agree with that rebate, eight thousand dollars to well-off people to get a new car. I don't believe that at all. Mm. Um, I, I, in fact, I'm not a supporter of any of those rebates. If you've got enough money to buy an eighty thousand dollar car, go and buy it yourself. And, yeah. and I know there'll, there'll be lots of people who will have an opinion on this, but I'm going to ask you about bikes. Mm. Should there be a bike levy? Well, no, I think sooner or later there will, particularly on these electric bikes. You know, some of them cost somewhere between three, six, eight, eight, eight thousand dollars. No, I, d- I disagree with Shane on this point. I think that we, particularly if you live in a city like Tamaki Makoto, you need cities that are, you need more walkable routes. You need you need to get the balance right in terms of, in terms of bike lane. Uh, there will be a predominance re- reliance on on driving. Uh, we do need a new mechanism in terms of how we fund our roading. Uh, the reality is there's going to be more and more electric. Electric vehicles, and in ten and fifteen years' time, that will be the dominant. The whole point of electric vehicles and bikes, though, mm. is that we um, reduce our carbon footprint. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there is a debate as to whether an electric car is as pure as the proponents um, would observe. But the reality is, the government believes mm. the case. But in, in making an electric car. You use a lot of rare earth minerals and you do generate a lot of emissions making that car. But my main objection about electric cars in New Zealand, you are not paying your way. And the sooner that we grapple that question, we're going to have a new source of revenue to maintain the quality and the resilience of our roads. I would park up. 
the majority of these uh, fanciful projects about bikes over the Harbour Bridge until we uh, recover the resilience of the New Zealand roading system. Shane, can I ask you a question? Do you think part of it is the fact that there are sort of three agencies involved in funding? Often you've got your local councils, you've got your regional councils, and you've got and you've got the central authority. Do you think part of it is a Yeah, I think in issue? areas like the mm. Bay of Plenty and up yeah. home in Taitokero, uh, central government is subsidising our regional, count- sorry, our local, well, essentially our regional communities because mm. there's not the income in those sparsely populated areas. But if you're asking me, is Waka Kotahi mm. uh, due for a revamp mm. and a restructuring? Uh, yes, by lunchtime. And, and I'm not saying that just because uh, the railway kid is sitting to my right, <laughs> but the reality is we still move far too much heavy goods by truck, and we ought to have, we ought to be investing more in rail because it's very efficient. <coughs> With that, Fakafiti mm. Atukiti Fanganui Atara. So now there are four inquiries into Nanaya Mahuta's alleged uh, conflicts of interest regarding her husband's government contracts. Minister Mahuta has consistently said uh, she flagged any conflict and stayed out of the decision making. Sh- uh, Shane Jones, has the government dealt with this swiftly enough? I see Shane Tipo giggling because I've suffered far too many inquiries myself. <laughs> but with that aside, um, it, it was inevitable. And once it became known that um, uh, Nanaya's husband, who I played golden oldie rugby with, and I did not want to say anything personal about mm. him at all, mm. or indeed the mm. minister. Mm. But look, this is a game where you've got to be um, purer than Caesar's wife, or in this case, Caesar Ressa's husband. And it's just part of the territory. Is it um, invasive? Is it nasty? Yes, if you look at uh, Twitter. But I, I've got to tell you, I've got a slightly different view about these things, Shane. Uh, mm-hmm. me. I've been in a very senior position, and you've got to be prepared to um, weather these types of storms. They feel as if they're dark and bleak and dangerous, but most of the time they clear. And I've, I, I wouldn't doubt Nanaya Mahuta's word that she has observed the uh, tenets of the Cabinet Manual. Did the, do you think that this government has acted fast enough? Uh, I think the government has not wanted to feed the uh, mm. either perception mm. or the appetite that is looking for Nanaya's head. Now, um, had, if I was in opposition, I would have worked out a different way to get her head. I wouldn't have gone for her husband. And the relatively um, small number of contracts, when one thinks of the huge number of contracts that PwC and a host of other monstrous consultants yeah. get, mm. you are talking about sums of money in the bigger schemes of thing. things are not inordinately large. Mm. But, hey, it's a perception, and they're going to have to defend themselves. Yeah. And as Shane said, conflicts of interest happen mm. with many politicians. With many. And but are some in the spotlight more than the other? Of course they are. And, you know, and Shane uh, alluded to the fact some of this is chump change. We're talking about a $26,000 uh, a program uh, in terms of prevent, pre- preventing suicide in, in Narawahia. Now, I know that program very well. It worked very effectively. Mm. The question I have is only $26,000, <laughs> you know, compared to, <laughs> compared to other cons- other consultants we're at. Remember what the impetus for the review from the State Service Commission, it was Nanaya Mahutu herself who went to the ministers and said we've w- that, that there needs to be a uh, an investigation into this. So, you know, it was the right thing for, for her to do. Should she have done a, a little bit earlier? Yes, perhaps. But I also don't think we can escape the blatant, ugly level of racism that has been levied at her uh, over three waters, over local body reform, uh, with the tacit approval, of, particularly of the National Party and Act. And we saw that with Groundswell when, when the leader of the opposition would turn up and you would see a level of nastiness that I haven't seen in a long, long time. Politics is robust. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, debate is robust. But I haven't seen the level of hatred uh, that's been directed, um, particularly at Nanaya Mahutu, uh, over the last year or so. Let's get into the, the the debate of politics mm. because uh, this week or oh, last week in the House, the Minister for Children Calvin Davis had to apologise to Act MP Karen True uh, after his demeaning comments to her. What do you think, Shane? I think Calvin uh, probably wasted some political capital on someone who is a no one, yeah. somebody who's a nobody. Mm. Um, the Act Party have run a cynical campaign since the last election, seeking to undermine the Māori cabinet ministers 
by either spreading rumours or feeding tropes. Mm. I mean, it was David, for example, who in the middle of uh, COVID, David Seymour I'm mm. talking about, in the middle of COVID, ran that line that uh, uh, if you're Māori or if you've got a thimble full of Māori blood, then you'll get a free pass and you'll get an early ejection, mm. injection and you'll live before a white person. In actual fact, the stats have just come out and it's actually PIs in Māori who disproportionately have suffered through COVID. But once David Seymour did that, knowingly, then he mandated his two or three Māori members to do that. But once they do it uh, and um, meet more robust politicians on the other side, Shane, you're always going to have um, return fire. Yeah, I, yep. I, I, I thought it was a little clumsy for two reasons. First of all, I think it brought to prominence someone who who is politically um, uh, unknown and uh, probably pushed, probably helped act out in terms of you know, some mm. of their financial backers. Uh, and the other thing is that, you know, you see it online um, where people will, will say, well, this is racist and they and they support and, and, and they will say, oh, look, let's not attack their whakapapa. But actually, they, they're just using that for their own political purposes. purposes. They've never supported people's um, uh, right to claim whakapapa. They don't support Māori issues uh, for all of those reasons. And, you know, if you just compare it to Willie Jackson, he went after, you know, people that had political prominence in terms of David Seymour himself, Simon Bennett when you're dealing, and, and Paula Bennett and I know at the that time. You say that she, <coughs> I know that you say that she hasn't had a lot of experience mm. in the House and things like that, but when you consider that her background is as yes. a survivor of state yes. care, do you have to pull up a little bit? Yeah, I would have. I would have. I would have. I, I particularly would have pulled up um, in relation to you know her her backstory. Um, the reality is that a lot of our people are disenfranchised um, from their from their Fano Hapa and Iwi, and particularly um, we all have different and, views, and, well, and views. particularly um, state state uh, wards. But you know, here's the other thing: is that uh, the Maori uh, with an act, they have to question themselves when they stand a, 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 um, idly by, or they enhance the type of tropes that David Seymour uses against our people on a, on a daily basis. This was the same guy. Not only not only did he say that uh, we were benefiting as a result of the, the COVID rollout and how it was rolled out, that he tried to undermine the process by releasing, uh, by, the... by releasing that information. Yes, mm. and, mm. and actually, as you say, um, Māori and Pacifica were you know, most vulnerable mm. during the pandemic. And also, Waipadata just released um, some stats recently that I think they... Um, immunised, 80% of the people they immunised were non-Māori. So Absolutely. Yeah, and no, no, I, I, I think that whoever is Māori and takes on Waipareta Trust, they've got to be prepared mm. to, for a re- robust response. It's just the nature of politics, mm. for goodness sake. For Māori, um, there's a new mm. bill, it's called the Therapeutic Remedies and Bill, it includes um, Rungoa Māori, mm. um, and people are concerned about this. People are saying it's the Tohunga, Tohunga Suppression Act Part 2. Mm. What do you think, mm. Shane? Well, I recall Dover Samuels and Parikura Horomia Um, ensuring that there was no regime that was going to be imposed over Māori medicine or rungoa Māori, because it's both lifestyle, it's spiritual, and the three of us know that a lot of whānau derive quite a lot of well-being by having that connection. Yeah, and uh, having had a few illnesses myself, you'll you'll take anything to improve your health. So I'm really surprised... I'm really surprised that the Green Party and the Labour Party, certainly the large number of Māori, have allowed this um, this hammer, this bludgeon, to appear in legislation. I think it's uh, I think it's a gross overreaction, and it uh, casts, in my view, a pall. Have they their taken judgment. their eye off the ball? Yeah, perhaps, but I don't think it'll. I, I I think it'll get weeded out before it's before the legislation um Minister Little reaches, says reaches that um, the Māori Health Authority mm. will have oversight yeah. over the over Rungoa Māori. But <laughs> I mean should it even be in there? Well I, I reckon in some way it should. I actually think we're missing the opportunity. I'll just tell a quick little story. Some years ago I was in China. I got very unwell. I went to uh, a, just a, a, a general public hospital in China. I saw two doctors. I saw a Western doctor and I saw a traditionally trained uh, Chinese um, mm. uh, doctor. And they gave me a green prescription and they gave me uh, just Western medicine. And I think that with our, with our new um, construct, uh, that's that's a real possibility. So perhaps some good will come out of this uh, court at all. Mm. You'd like to see two doctors in hospitals? Mm. Mate, when I was that crook, You'd see anyone. Uh, with dengue fever, I would have seen I would have seen a Muslim priest, I would have seen a Catholic priest, an Anglican priest, a Western trained doctor, a tohunga, anything to get better. Yeah. 
Who knows what we'll see. Um, while we're there, let's talk about Farmac because there's been some disappointment in the list as everyone talks about it. Um, Shane, is there an argument for the Māori Health Authority to manage a portion of Farmac funding for those diseases yeah. that Māori are ab- ab- more vulnerable? Ab- absolutely. For instance, you know, uh, melanoma, because of our skin tone, uh, is, is an issue, but prostate prostate cancer is more of an issue and so I think it just gives us the ability to direct the resources uh, where, where we see fit I'm I'm not a super fan of um, Pharmac but I just don't know what model is, is better than than this, there are some benefits in terms of bulk buying, the reality is that um, that uh, the list of the list and, 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 and people will never be totally happy with it uh, but having said that, when the pressure is on they soon find the ability to to, to mm, you know, add yeah. to the list, and you know, there's lots of examples mm-hmm. of that. Mm. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I think the most uh, well, the most mm. uh, prominent example I can recall was Herceptin. Mm. And uh, look, I don't want to go into the details, but there were some people we knew in Kaitai, and um, sadly, they weren't uh, around. They didn't live long enough for the Herceptin. So that was Tony O'Reilly. That was Tony Ryle. Mm. So that shows if you have determined governments and politicians. They will solve Pharmax problems for them. But Pharmax is a rationing agency. Mm. And uh, to the extent that I understand their processes, they're driven purely by clinicians. And uh, I think as our. But isn't pop- that the issue? Is it's whoever can campaign for the drug that That's they my need. Point. I think as our population changes and there's greater problems now with morbidity. Uh, obesity mm. and these things are growing as 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 our brown population grows. To be honest with you, so if, if pharmac and and the medical profession are not looking at those rela- those diseases, there's always going to be a disproportionately negative impact mm. on a lot of the people in that community. We'll leave it there because I want to talk about ACC. The who uh, raised an issue about a young man who was electrocuted. He lost both of his arms mm. uh, when the pole he was holding made contact with a power mm. line. Um, and for all, and and while he did receive ACC, the full ACC, with the help of a lawyer, it raises questions around whether those working as contractors are, in fact, contractors or employees. In this case, um, he was on twenty seven dollars an hour. Mm. Um, he had to provide all of his gear. He had to provide all of his safety uh, gear at the at the same time. Um, and the difference would have been about fifteen k had he not have had the lawyer. Are we doing enough for no. workers? No, we're not, and particularly workers that are the most vulnerable, and they do tend to be Māori, <coughs> and they do tend to be Māori men that work in, in those industries such as forestry, such as construction. Um, and, you know, I followed the, I followed that case. He wasn't a contractor. He was, a, he was an employee. And, you know, we've had, we had the massive swing the other way in terms of a, 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 a loss of workers right under the Employment Contracts Act. And, again, I know I overuse this word, but we do need to change the contract and I see... And I think the fair pay agreements are more than more than just about wages. They're all also about having health and safety mechanisms in place. And one of the things we need to do immediately is ensure that the, on those high risk sites there are trained health and safety officers, which they lacked on that particular day. Yes, and so when I spoke to Rowani Pereira, the reporter, she said, you know, the law is, the law allows you to set up a company, um, contract a couple of you know, trained uh, scaffolders and then you're in business because the rest of you, you can just contract everyone else. And, but there's never um, a choice when you're going in. You can't say, oh, I'd like to be an employee, please, because mm. you won't get the job. They want mm. you as a contractor. And so many of these young people don't have a, um, a, a printer or, you know, DocuSign to sign all their contracts and to print things off. Mm. It's, they're really on the back foot. We're really talking about the Uberization of the yeah. workforce. Mm, the gig economy. And Big pardon? The gig economy. Yeah, yeah. Mm. The gig economy, that's mm. a better term. And uh, I just think that the regulatory framework hasn't caught up with it. I also think that politicians often focus on the amount of money in uh, on a person's hand, but often these young people, they're desperate to maintain their job. They're working in situations where they probably don't have enough support of a professional nature. And to the extent that the ACC should be helping this case and the fact that he needed a lawyer, in my view, is a very, very bleak But they're not. And we hear these stories all the time that there is no support when things like this happen. And when you look at, um, you know, the fact that Māori are on average only 25 years old, we were talking about... Um, uh, you know, car accidents and that group of men uh, under 25. Do we need a, a 
you know, what do we need to do to ACC so that they can be supporting? Is it like a Maori ACC? Well, well I, I think there's a big picture here. I think we've seen, you know, as we said, the Uber, um, um, the gig economy take effect, uh, and and the list and and the loss of collective rights. You know, uh, the reality is that if you work on a big work site and probably in the private sector, say a teacher or a nurse or whatever, you're going to be unionised. These folks work in uh, sites that are spread over. Um, a large sort of geographical area, so I think that we need a move, uh, a move towards um, collective rights, and also I think we need to crack down on um, this spurious argument that you know you are a contractor and not an employee, because the reality is that if you're working for the one employer, you're doing the one job, mm. and, uh, and 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 that one employer is paying you. You're an employee. You're not a contractor. Mm. You know the the. The disasters we saw in the forestry sector yep. about five to ten years ago, now uh, touch wood, they're no longer as common, mm. but that took a blitzkrieg-like approach from the regulators to the owners, and the owners tried to outsource the responsibility to these undercapitalized groups around Kaitaia, mm. Gisborne, and that was a very, very ugly episode but they have managed to improve their prospects. And I just wonder, Shane, um, the lessons that we learned there, they're going to have to ap- uh, apply them to other areas of infrastructure and construction. Yeah, and I think and I think it's about holding, holding the employers and the directors a heck of a lot more responsible. In, in the case of uh, Jaden, uh, I think the, um, I'm sorry, of the, of, the, of the young person that was died on Dutrua, um, they, you know, the whanau got $100,000 um, when, you know, f- quite basic health and safety uh, processes weren't followed. And uh, s- some of these directors of companies are people of wealth and they <coughs> need to be hold, m- held more accountable. And, you know, th- if, if I go off t- today and I drive in an erratic way and I kill someone, I can be done for manslaughter on my car. Um, but uh, there's no such thing as corporate manslaughter. And uh, when employers are so belligerent and dismissive of basic and fundamental health and safety provisions, they ought to be held criminally accountable. But before we wrap up, I'm going to ask you about elections and you can talk about whichever mm. polls and elections you want yeah. to, but we do have the local body wrapping up on the 8th of October, I think that's Saturday, and we've been talking earlier mm. about, um, you said in the House, you can feel that an election is coming. Uh, yeah, I was um, down in Wellington, uh, Mihi, last week, I think for the 73rd birthday of the Republic of China. So went along as someone who's, uh, you know, was in the fishing industry, so we relied a hell of a lot on making money out of China. But uh, while I was down there, it was evident when I watched the day in the house that there was a, there, there, there was a frizz on in the air, and I happened to bump into Jerry Browning, and he said, it's game on. Yeah. Now, uh, on the question of local government, I have been to Aonui and Kaitaia, and I have encouraged people to fill in their orange forms, Kapai and you. indeed, I have taken them up Kapai. to the local library and made them hand them in. Yes, Kapai, and you? Oh, look, just on, on, on terms of local body elections, it's too hard to vote. If my papers didn't arrive, I had to travel in the city to get a special vote. You have to take ID. A lot of our people don't uh, ID. We need to make it as easy as possible to vote. I don't understand why you can vote at your local library, but you can't cast a special what's, vote. What's a better system? Oh, I think I, I think that we just make it easier, that we allow we allow for more places where you can uh, take um, uh, special votes, and I think we have to look at mechanisms like... Uh, having a, le- a proper election day, having postal ballots and online. I think all of those Are you things a fan will of encourage online? participation. Shane? Yeah, we're going to get yeah. to electronic yeah. voting. Yeah. Everyone's going to end up with an ID card. Let's face it, yeah. if you're part of the New Zealand workforce, you've got an IRD number yeah. anyway. Uh, and I, I just think once a more tech-savvy, hmm. paper-averse generation yeah. come to pass, they'll find a way of... Um, Electrifying voting. Just quickly, anything to look forward to in the next couple of weeks? Well, the results in the local body elections. Yes, of course. Um, I think I think that's who it. Who you going to who you who you who you backing for a well, while? Uh, I'm I'm concerned about my man, Officer Collins, uh, up, up here. But uh, but the numbers in terms of turnout, are, uh, particularly in South West, West Auckland, are looking okay. In Wellington, I think Tory Fano is going to win that. Auckland, mm. Shane Jones. Oh, well, I'm a Wayne Brown man. In and, Wellington, and, uh, Paul Eagle. And anyone up north that you think's going to? Oh come well, through? I might end up talking about my brother or my son, so I better sort of put a stone on my tongue. Kapai, yeah, kapai. Well, just quickly, the two young Māori people, any of them got a chance of winning the mayoralty? 
No, I don't think so, but definitely holding um, prominent positions as councillors. Uh, young <laughs> Moko and Tai Tokere and the boys Shorten and Fai. <laughs> well, that's us. Uh, that's party people for this week. E hoa ma. Ka nui te mihi ki te puna whakatonga rewa mōna i tautoko i tēnei kaupa. But don't forget, you can catch us online, um, Facebook, or download us on Apple Podcasts. Tēnā kōrua, mō o kōrua kōrero, te wānanga, no horo mai rā. RNZ News at 7. Good evening. Ngā mihi o te pō, ko Evie Ashton tēnei. Twelve people have contracted hepatitis from frozen berries and seven are in hospital. Health authorities are now investigating and the supermarket chain Foodstuffs has recalled a number of PAMS brands of the berries. Food Safety Deputy Director General Vincent Arbuckle says so far eight of the 12 cases are linked by genetic sequencing meaning they are likely to have been exposed to the same source of the virus.